Ministry of Agriculture. And uh, for the next panel about SDO regulation and the future of fundraising, uh, Vaiba Kadikan, who is CEO and founder at Close Cross. STOs are, so we're not going to go into that, but we're going to go into something more specific about the STO regulation and the future of fundraising. So I'm going to introduce some panel members here who are going to come and join us in the discussion. Tim Bion from OKCoin unfortunately couldn't make it, but we are going to have other people, so I'd like to invite JD Salvego, uh, CEO of Legion Ventures. Come in, JD. Next, I'll get in Shamik Borekhi, COO of Bitday. We've then got James Faruccia, partner at Ganado Advocates. And last but not least, Joe Portelli, the executive chairman of the Malta Stock Exchange. joining us, panelists. Um, some ground rules very quickly. We've got 20 minutes. We're going to ask some very important questions. Feel free to contradict and get into a debate, but let's make it constructive. No name calling, right? Uh, we're all friends here. We're going to hear a lot of different thoughts, so let's keep it nice. Okay, so let me kick it off. Um, STOs are very much like IPOs, if you look at it from an outside perspective. Will the people really invest because it's a novel vehicle to invest with? Or is it something which is really compelling and different? And I'll start with JD. Uh, I think it's actually completely different. Uh, what we're doing with uh, innovating the primary and secondary markets is, is what we're doing is, is creating systems that are going to be enhanced by technology, right? What we're doing is innovating the taxi industry like Uber did. So it's the same type of um, derivatives, securities, bonds, but now it's with an enhanced system utilizing blockchain distributed letter, ledgers and smart contracts. So, Matt, would you like to add to that? Yeah, like, we are looking at the STO very, very much like IPO, but we, from our perspective, the trading is going to be totally different. So, we prefer our systems to be ready for very extensive settlement and clearing for institutional companies who are going to join the market. So now, they are all waiting for the regula regulations. So once they come, the flow on the exchange from our perspective is going to be totally different. This is different than the retail clients who is coming and make, making basically one transaction. Either small for $100 or a million dollars, but there is the one transaction. Institutional traders are trading a lot, so we will do the proper proper settlement and clearing for them and, and all the infrastructure that is important from the exchange point of view. Okay. As far as far as I'm concerned, I think that STOs will definitely enhance the efficiency when it comes to trading. Uh, they will most definitely make settlement a much more certain event. The technology in its own right will help in terms of this, the, 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 settle, the time to settle effectively because we will be able to achieve a, a T0 sort of settlement um, mechanism, which is something which is definitely needed. At the moment, the risk is that we might end up with an element of fragmentation in the sense that obviously security tokens must exist on the blockchain. The risk is that promoters will start creating their own emission blockchain, right? So you might end up a particular exchange or, or a particular promoter creating its own blockchain. So all those security tokens which, which want to list on that exchange will go on that secure on that blockchain. Another one might create its own blockchain, which might not necessarily speak to each other. Yeah. Speak to the other one very imminently, because there might need to be an adjustment to deal with that. 
so uh, the risk is that everyone will come, will come up with this penalty. Blockchain and you will end up in a situation where different security companies will exist in their own small world, in their own small blockchain, rather than sort of being more globally, more globally accepted. Okay. Sure, what do you think? Okay. Well, as, as I think you know, the Montessar change last year took very decisive steps to make our mark in the digital asset space. Uh, we signed three high-profile MOUs, one with OKX, the other one with Binance. The OKX application has been submitted to the regulator. We are genuinely hoping that by year-end, we will be one of the first security token exchanges in the world to actually be up and running. We can't say we're the first in the EU because there is the GDX which is called this option. But having said that, it's it's very strategic, strategically important for the whole subject to move into this space for two reasons. One, it supports the strategy of the country in general to be this blockchain island. But the other reason is because we genuinely believe it could generate uh, significant revenue for the multi option over the next few decades. Uh, I personally am a serious believer in the concept of security tokens. I think they're potentially in a very efficient and cost-effective way to enter the capital markets. There are some, uh, I don't want to say negative, negatives, but there certainly will be hurdles, particularly liquidity. Um, but we're very, very positive on security tokens and, and how it's going to change the capital market landscape. Well, so it's very good to hear that you are as excited about SGOs, even though you are the chairman of the market solid. I think there are the good things we can expect out of the space here. So, and I'll start with you again, Joe. Do you see regulators in the space as enablers? And I just don't talk about the Malta, but that was my question than that. Or is this just something you deal with to get your way in how you want to shape the financial markets? That's a really good question. Uh, I think the MFCA has done an excellent job regulating the space or attempting to regulate the space because at this time we don't have any regulated security token exchanges. There are two uh, that I am aware of that are currently in the pipeline. One is the OKMSX application and the other one is the ABE AIM application. I am plugging them. You might be wondering why the multi options would care about a potentially a competing security token exchange. We don't find, we don't look at them as competing. They're going to be using our CSD. So what we are doing, which I think is different to a lot of what other exchanges are doing, is we are aiding, abetting, we are encouraging foreign uh, token exchanges to come to Malta to set up within this ecosystem because we think we can monetize relationships. In fact, we were in New York um, last year, the most options did delegation, and we had meetings with a number of um, well-known, highly regarded security token exchanges, and, and we encourage them to come and set up in Malta. So I think the regulation, I'm hoping the regulation will be thoughtful, it will be mythic compliance regulation, so it will be regulation we're comfortable with. The concern we have to have is ESMA, what they're doing on the pan European system, what their take is. Um, however, in another few months, the multi stock exchange will be hosted the World Federation of Exchanges, Derivatives, and Clearing Conference. And we're expecting a bunch of regulators from ESMA. And They'll be there and we'll be able to pretty much, I think, let me say, lobby them and, and sell our narrative that security tokens are a good thing. If they're well regulated, they can add a lot of value, particularly with CMU and capital markets uh, So, you know, I mean, we're bullish and we hope that the regulators do the right thing. Okay, thank you for that. And James, you deal with the regulators in support of the companies that are coming in. What's your perspective? Let's be clear. I think the MFSA took the right steps as to what we call business consultation opinion, which we are broadly in agreement with the principle set out, uh, set out therein. But the devil is really in the detail. It is more complicated to set up a security token than people might think. Uh, 
there are considerations which come out of the company exactly which has been with us for many, many, many years, which hasn't really been designed within the context of tokenized securities. So, there are considerations that must be taken into account, both within the context of the design of the blockchain which will house the token, but also the smart contract which will create the token, the security token itself. And there are principles in, in company law which naturally need to be factored into all this design. So you need to know who your shareholders are, you need to register all the transfers, right? You need to perhaps carry out a certain element of AM and KYC on the, on the token holders. There might be step duty considerations on transfers. So there are many, so many considerations that have to be taught properly before one uh, attempts to get on with it and, and offer, it, offer a security token. Like everything, I think that the way things will develop is that we will see security tokens being used more and more by SMEs. Once an element of experience is gained in the launch of these form of securities, then hopefully we will see them being applied more and more mainstream and in, in the medium term. But it's we are still sort of crawling when it comes to to security tokens. Hopefully we'll start sort of walking soon and then we'll start jogging as well. That's very well said, it's very well said. And it's great to hear the perspectives from you because you really are in between the two sides of this world where it's the companies and the regulators on the other side. So, Shambek and Jenny, I'm going to ask you a slightly different take on this, okay? Now, if there was one piece of advice or information you would like to share with the regulators, what would that be? And Shambek, I'll start with you. I have a lot of pieces. Or JD. I got about 50 pages on that I could, I, I could offer. But, you know, I, I think one of the biggest things is, is to let innovation thrive, right? I mean, the whole instance of blockchain is built off of to kind of rebel and fix the, centraliz the control and centralization of power, fraud within governments, Wall Street, the banking industries that we being American caused a global crash, right? So, you know, at the, at the same time, like I was mentioning the, the Uber example, we're innovating a very, very strong power, right? I, I mean, I was having this conversation earlier in a business meeting that this industry is going to take a long time to innovate. That what we're talking about right now, the securities industry, secondary environment, because we're dealing with the powers that control the economies on a global level. We're dealing with America, the Federal Reserve, Wall Street. It's also disrupting billions and billions of dollars of their money. Sorry. Uh, blockchain, should be ledger, and smart contracts will create a uh, disintermediary uh, between uh, securities, uh, investors, and everything. So all the counterparty risks will disappear. All the counterparty entities will disappear. Also, it's going to force all those companies to be completely transparent. And all that information will be immutable. You think all those companies are going to want to have to put up with that? So, as I, I, I try to push that as a big point a lot because I, I think a lot of companies and a lot of people in this industry, and I've worked with all of the, the leaders in this industry in digital securities, and a lot of them in America I think are doing a really great job right now, and then even in, in Europe. Um, but we have a long road ahead. That's, that's the bottom line right now. Everyone thought this industry was going to take, or like we're going to have a secondary market at the end of this year. We have nothing. We have like six coins being traded right now with no liquidity, right, uh, on a secondary market. We have some decent stuff on issuance, primarily coming out of the U.S. for the most. But if this is going to take a long time, and I think we have to sit here and face the reality of what we're up against, that, you know, Wall Street and the financial institutions are not going to let this go to us right away, you know what I mean? And very easily. Right. So Sonic, what would you say? Yeah, I think that what I advise to all the regulators is to basically speak with each other more and work on one like solid uh, rules for us uh, to, to let us prepare for basically standard rules all over the world because it's going to be we have a lot of uh, experience in our team and with IPOs, but only in one country that we had to deal with one regulator. That was easy. Now we are looking at three or four jurisdictions and it's going to be very hard to onboard clients and 
we've, you know, security tokens in the secondary market with, like, same flow, like, with utility tokens. So, it, it doesn't look like it's going to happen soon. But we, we would love to have, like, this year, let's say, or next month, or next week, we are ready, but they are not ready. Yeah, no, and I think that's a very good point in terms of having one global SQ market would be definitely beneficial. I think as we understand how the regulations work, especially for the SDOs, that might be way more challenging than how it is for the utility companies per se, right, in terms of regulations. Now that also gets in the way of actually creating a liquidity, Jay, what you mentioned before, right? So what are the mechanisms that you guys think need to be in place to improve the liquidity so that SDOs can actually deliver on the promise that they've made for so long? Go ahead. We need better regulation because right now we have a chicken or the egg thing, right? Uh, this market is only going to thrive if there's actually a primary and secondary market meaning investors, right? So right now we have not too many investors. We have a lot of interest, but also skepticism. They want to see what's going to happen, but it's a chicken or the egg because until someone starts really investing to set an example, it's not going to move. So we're going to have these little spikes, like when Harvard just said they're going to, you know, did that deal for 100 million. You know, and then uh, BTG Pactual or whatever the big investment bank in Brazil did that $50 million distressed real estate asset fund. And then they did a, a press release for the billion dollar real estate fund out of the Middle East to see if it actually happened, right? We need some more of those, not just issuance. Because, you know, there's a lot of companies that uh, securitize and done pretty well on issuance, right? But we don't see too much after that, either, right? Yeah, I would say the same. Like, the problem is going to be where those assets are going to be basically dead on the exchange, so no one will want to trade them so actively. So the important is to have proper settlement and clearing for institutional traders to clear in one place, trading them in multiple exchanges, so the assets can move pretty fast so, and cost efficient, of course. Let's not forget, however, that from a regulatory standpoint, the rules are there, and the rules are technology agnostic in the sense the framework on the our companies that are under the prospectus directive missing they don't care whether a security is in the materialized form or whether it is in tokenized form the rules apply exactly the same way the issue is that they might need to be slightly tweak to of existing the manner in which the technology effectively operates but by and large we should i don't think we should expect this framework which has been in place for decades to change drastically to accommodate this, this new technology. It needs to be viewed, I think, as the other way around. And if we think, in particular I'm saying in the security token space, that these security tokens are going to disintermediate the market, it is not going to be the case. Because if you are trading a security token on a security token exchange, you need a broker to access the exchange. You need a clearing and settlement mechanism clear and settle that transaction. The past the process will definitely be more efficient because you don't need multiple layers between the CSP and the custodian facing the client that multi-layer custody function can be collapsed into one or two layers at most. But apart from that, it is important to keep in mind that we need to focus on doing what we are doing today more efficiently, with more certainty, and more in a more cost-effective in a more cost-effective manner. And we need to focus on these benefits that the use of blockchain and security tokens will bring uh, will bring on the table, rather than talking about this intermediation and talking about that clients will have direct access to their to their tokens, which is generally an impossibility because only regulated custodians can safe key assets and have an account on a CSD, right? So having a listed and traded security token which is held in, in my wallet on my phone is, is an impossibility as things stand today because the regulation just doesn't allow it and if we think that that is the way we should be heading, it's not going to happen because it's very unlikely that regulators in Europe or even globally are going to make such a massive U-turn in terms of regulatory practices. Because 
as I said, regulation should be technologically agnostic. At most, it should have minor tweaks to accommodate, but not change the feeling the, the way things are, things are being done from a structure. Okay, so we heard revolution and a friendly revolution. Joe, what do you think? Uh, well, Please agree with me. <laughs> There are lawyers, so we generally agree with everything they say. <laughs> uh, keeps us out of trouble. Right? We can always blame the lawyers. You know? uh, I think we need to put things in perspective. So, if you look at the market capitalization of all the equities and all the bonds and all the REITs, which are listed on stock exchanges all over the world, you're looking at roughly 150 trillion in assets. If you look at all the over-the-counter derivatives and all these flops out there, you're looking at another $500 trillion in assets. So when you look at all of these global assets, not including real estate and all that, just financial assets, you're looking at, let's say, $650 trillion in assets. If you take all the cryptocurrencies out there, I don't think they add up to $1 trillion. I don't know what the number is, constantly changes, but about a trillion. The market is tiny. It is infinitesimal. It's insignificant. So I do agree with James. I think when security, when the security token rush does hit, I think it'll, uh, I think it'll focus on the SMEs. You know, if you look at global companies, I mean, 98 percent of all the companies out there are they're SMEs, right? The companies employ less than 20 people, and these companies need capital. It used to be that banking was a traditional source of capital. Well, guess what? It's going to change now. Because now we have a new outlook. We have a situation where you can come to the multi stock exchange, okay, in the sex, and you can find a broker, find a lawyer, and say, listen, I need to raise five million. And how can I do it? And, you know, the lawyers are going to offer you this cost effective opportunity called security tokens. Fantastic. Right, so one final question, one word answer. What's the best place to launch an SDO? All of them, of course. Okay. So on that unanimous note, I'll thank the panelists very much. I hope people have been able to get something out of the discussion and feel free to reach the panelists after the discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.